My name is Yvonne Wilmer, and this is panel three, The Ground is Always Shifting. Um, before we begin the panel, I have a few standard opening comments. First of all, the Cascadia Poetry Festival thanks the Snunaimok people on whose traditional territory we are gathered. We would also like to thank Vancouver Island University for providing the space and support and the VIU Faculty of Arts and Humanities for their generous donation of financial assistance for the festival. We also need to thank the Nanaimo Tourism Development Fund, the Canada Council for the Arts, the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, and Cascadia Now for their funding. Also, there are many sponsors who are listed in your program who you can thank personally later. Washrooms are just outside the top door, and cell phones should be quiet. Oh, oh, I'm going to use my cell phone to read a poem. Um, because I left the book that the poem's in at home. It happens. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, it was online. So today, we're talking about aspects of living together in a geographically, culturally, socially diverse bioregion. And from listening to the previous panel, I was thinking one question I might place to the panel and to the audience is, how have things changed for diverse cultures in the bioregion, if they have, and how can they change? So that might be a question to think about while I introduce you to the panelists. Amber Dawn, who won the Marmot. Amber is a writer living on unceded indigenous land belonging to the Coast Salish peoples, incorporated Vancouver, Canada. She is the author of the Lambda Award winning magical realism novel, Sub Rosa, and the memoir, How Poetry Saved My Life, a Hustler's Memoir, winner of the 2013 Vancouver Book Award. Her writing traverses themes of sex work, queer identity, survivor pride, and the transformative power of literature. The Georgia Strait says her poetry is lit by compassion and courage, a tribute to survivors. Her new book, Where the Words End and My Body Begins, is a collection of glosas that honor the lives and words of queer feminist poets. Glosas are poems that borrow four lines from another poet's poem and then use those four lines in a new poem. Amber teaches at Douglas College in Vancouver. Our next panelist is Gary Godfriedson. <laughs> Gary is from Kamloops, BC. He is a self-employed rancher from the Sechpumech, oh dear. Just say Shushwa. <laughs> <laughs> from the Shushwa, this is why First Nations languages should be taught in schools. Um, Gottfriedson is strongly rooted his cultural teachings. He is currently the principal at the Skellet School of Excellence in Kamloops. He holds a master's degree in education. In 1987, the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado, awarded a creative writing scholarship to Godfriedson. There, he studied under Allen Ginsberg, Marianne Faithful, and others. Godfriedson has eight published books. He has read from his work across Canada, in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Nadine Antoinette Maestas earned her PhD, she's our third panelist, from the University of Washington, where she wrote a dissertation on postmodern anthropoetics. She also holds an MFA from the University of Michigan, where she was awarded the Hopwood Farrar Award for playwriting. Her hybrid poem play, Helen on Wheels, a play of rhyme and reason, was performed at California College of the Arts. She is the co-author with Karen Weiser of Beneath the Bright Discuss. Poets and Poets Press, and has published in Pageboy Magazine, The Germ, and Poor Moho Almanac. So those are our three panelists. Please welcome them.
Now My Poem by Adrian Rich. And I think it's come up a few times during the festival so far, the art of listening and how important listening is. And Adrian Rich touches on that in this poem. There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. I've walked there picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled. This isn't a Russian poem. This is not somewhere else but here, our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of the woods, meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf mold paradise. I know already who wants to buy it, sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. Adrian Rich. So now let's turn to Amber Dawn. Hi there. Um, receiving an invitation to Cascadia was such an honor, and it certainly provided me the opportunity to think about uh, where I come from and the relationship that I have to community building and placemaking. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in the ancestral territory of the Attawandaran, uh, or the neutral peoples, uh, in southern Ontario. It's a small community of about 4,000, very small community where I come from, uh, just on the northeast shore of Lake Erie. Um, it's a place that's frequently listed among Canada's poorest postal codes. Um, I left home at age 16. By 17, I had found my way to Vancouver, uh, where I have been living for the last 23 years. Uh, like many girls who were forced out of their communities of origin because of trauma, uh, I found myself not only in Vancouver, but on Maine and Hastings. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the downtown east side in Vancouver, uh, if you don't already know a thing or two about it. Um, the downtown east side can boast being the oldest community in Vancouver. Um, again, this is sort of a, a colonial um, measuring stick or a colonial uh, timeline. Uh, Vancouver incorporated in 1886, so fairly young city. Um, but within this younger city, the downtown east side is the oldest community. Uh, it's also the poorest postal code in all of Canada. It's remained the poorest postal code in all of Canada uh, for many, many years. Uh, the people who live in poverty are often criminalized poor, uh, so you see a high prevalence of drug use, uh, of sex work, uh, homelessness, uh, which is now officially a crime in Canada to be homeless. Uh, so uh, this is a neighborhood with a lot of tenacity. Um, it also has the distinction of being a neighborhood uh, with real staying power. Uh, many poor urban neighborhoods eventually get wiped from the map. Uh, the residents of those neighborhoods sort of get their move along papers. Uh, but the downtown uh, east side has just remained um, there, present, visible uh, for many, many years. Um, about 43% of the residents of the downtown east side are migrant peoples, uh, people with immigrant, refugee, um, or no legal status, legal status um, in Canada. Um, so while I can trace trauma, criminalization, uh, institutionalization in my family back for about three generations, that's about as far as I can identify, um, this in a way can be compared to really per pervasive colonial violence um, that is so evident in the downtown east side. Um, Aboriginal and women and girls uh, have created uh, a survivor, badass, matriarchal culture in the downtown east side. Uh, it is these women and girls that I think uh, we can credit the staying power of the neighborhood. Um, 
Yeah. There's a lot of ways I could describe the neighborhood. I, I could be up here for the entire panel talking about it. Um, but for right now, what I want to draw our attention to um, is this is a neighborhood that is perpetually witnessing, accounting for, and resisting erasure. I'll say it one more time. Witnessing, accounting for, and resisting erasure. It's a survivor culture. It's a culture that will not be erased, uh, even though there are many forces that are trying to do just that. Um, if anyone wants to discuss ideas of how to eris resist erasure this weekend, um, that's the kind of learning exchange I'm into. Living room conversation, perhaps. Um, poetry has been a form of resistance in the downtown east side for a long, long time. Uh, it's my belief that wherever you gather a bunch of survivors together, put them in, let's say, an eight block radius, as the downtown east side is, uh, you're bound to encounter a lot of artists and a lot of poets. Uh, it is definitely one of the highlights of the downtown east side community um, to just walk up Hastings and bump into half a dozen poets just on a short three block stroll. Um, here I'm going to mention Bud Osborne, may he rest in power. Um, I'm going to reference the Thursday Writing Collective, uh, which started in the 2000s and meets every Thursday at the Carnegie Community Center, uh, which is the city's oldest library and community center. Uh, the Downtown East Side Women's Center is where I wrote my first poem. Uh, I wrote it uh, in a program that supported women in literacy. Uh, I was trying to learn how to read and write. Uh, and I kept some of these poems. Um, amazing that I did, but I kept some of them for many, many years. And um, in 2013, when I published my memoir, How Poetry Saved My Life, um, I was able to gather some of these poems, uh, give them an edit, you know, for vanity's sake, and, uh, and publish them within my book. So I'm going to read a couple of these very, very early poems. Um, for me, this would be going back to the mid-90s. Chevron Rest Chevron Restroom, 1212 East Hastings. Eve's head fits perfectly into the chipped acrylic sink. She runs the faucet until she is faceless, then paints her cheekbones back in valentine pink, her eyebrows an impossible arc. Cherry swings the curling iron, the girls scatter, hairspray rubs bobby pins, hit the floor like hard rain. I'm the only ginger on Franklin, she warns me. I better not see your ratty, fake redhead tonight. Who's got cigarettes? Joe asks each of us and asks us again. Patchy Bell's cannon keeps ringing inside of Dee's imitation Prada handbag. The diamond is real, she lets everyone know. It looks like the first star against her old skin. Sissy smells like urine. She says a man took a piss on her while she nodded off in an alley. Those dog fuckers. Stains rotting her Minnie Mouse tracksuit. Drugstore red lipstick is all I need. A Lincoln town car will pick me up in the gas station parking lot. Watch. Working outside um, is a culture of keeping track of each other. Have you seen Dolores? Have you seen Missy? Have you seen Joanna? Yes, last time I saw Joanna, she was at the Funky Winker Bean. She went home with this guy. Uh, we're always trying to keep track of each other. When you live in a neighborhood like the downtown east side, poetry is a great place to keep track of each other. Poetry is a great place to witness and remember each other. Um, so I'm going to read uh, the title poem from my book, How Poetry Saved My Life. There wasn't a voice from above, no tunnel of light. I didn't awaken in a hospital room to doctors cheering, you're a lucky lady, you almost didn't make it. There was a missing women's poster wrapped around a telephone pole on the corner of Pandora and Victoria. When I say poetry saved my life, I should also mention other forces. By 1999, all the cars cru cruising the kitty stroll had power lock doors. Crystal meth turned the girls on each other, and I hated fighting women. Sheila Catherine Egan four years younger than I am, disappeared that previous July and still has not been found. 
I am white, and while my teens are likely predisposed to addiction, I can use and quit and use and quit anything. These privileges allowed me to admit that it was a terrifying time to be working outside. And I no longer wanted to die. 4,000 miles away from the small riverbed town where I was born. And yes, poetry must be thanked too. The written word can be a faithful witness if you're willing to show yourself. Moreover, poetry reunited me with a girl who didn't mind the endless backwoods tree line, was thrilled by the sound of coyotes screaming at night. Someday I'll write about her. Yeah, thank you. So I kept writing, and I kept writing, and I kept writing, uh, and, and it brought me to my second book, uh, which just came out this spring. Um, I realized through writing this book that resisting erasure, when I talk about resistance, um, this is an action of the intellect for me. It's a political action. Um, but more so I'm looking, I'm searching, and, and the search has been more of an emotional journey for me. It's been, I search with my heart. Um, and I think that's why I keep writing poetry, is I'm, I'm still looking, still looking for all uh, the loved ones, especially the women uh, that are no longer in my life. Um, and through writing I try to acknowledge their remarkable existence in this world. Uh, so I'll finish with just one last poem. Uh, it is a glossa poem. Yvonne, thank you for mentioning what a glossa does. Uh, I chose a quatrain from Lydia Kwa, uh, a wonderful poet. You should check her out. Uh, originally born in Singapore, she moved to Vancouver some time ago. Not only is she a, a poet, um, but she's also a clinical psychologist, and she keeps a practice in the downtown east side, sort of a, a, a wonderful little office place that sort of borders Chinatown in the downtown east side. Um, and this quatrain I'm borrowing from a book, Sinuous, that she wrote. Um, and Sinuous, in many ways, is, is sort of a treatise on trauma or how to reconcile with trauma. Um, so it just seemed like a perfect poet um, and a perfect book to choose a quatrain from. Her quatrain reads, What makes someone capable of creating a new paradigm and living it? Who owns that willingness to create? Over five dollar lattes, a dear old and I reminisce upon our all-time favorite suicide plans. XYZ Pharmacy, I say. Buy shady methadone, then head up Hastings to the Second Empire skyscraper. I have a rooftop key. Wonder if you can still score fizzies at XYZ, dear old asks. She makes culture for the city now, me, university, square pegs cobbled into round holes, gray mare whores in a greener graze. Do we miss the glory days? Retrospect blur, I can look back until I see double. What makes one capable of so much change? Hand -to -mouth survival is off the schedule, and it seems I have freed up time for existential questions. Aesthetics fluxed when I realized I'd live. All that beauty that once wanted nothing to do with me is now ubiquitous. Beaumont Pink <clears throat> is my newest mentor. Color therapy, whatever helps us carry on. There are no wrongs. Forgiveness is tactile, learning, touch, movement, sound, repeat. Self-love mastered by mnemonics, the sing-song rhyme of creating a new paradigm. We hear with our ear. Rhythm helps your tender heart move. And the wise old owl lived in the oak. The more she saw, the less she spoke. There is a question I still haven't answered in verse. What happened to the others? I lost more than mercury and sweat during detox. Where's my down at the heel line? Come up dreamers, beasties, the pretty grass, those existing by the minute and living it so close to the bone. Where's their microphone? What stage has been erected for the disaffected? What wall to mount a crack jaw collage? The exhibition hall is narrow space. Think of the minds mislaid in the pinch. Oh, but how loss makes us look for glint and change. One empire's trash is our place de resistance. Are you like me? Did you have to see the precise shade of your own spilled blood before you knew what you must do? 
then you also know struggle and art making can be the same. Then you also understand who owns that willingness to create. So I'm not, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. I'm a pretty pragmatic woman. I'm not much of a scholar, to be honest with you. I'm really hands-on. Um, so I'd love to just end what I have to say with a call to action. Um, investing in underheard voices is so important. It's what all of us as writers and lovers of poetry can be doing and should be doing. Um, whether this is making book donations um, to a book to prisoners organization or a drop-in for women, volunteering some of your time, call up an organization that you know has a drop-in center and say, hey, do you think some of your participants would like to do a creative writing workshop? I could volunteer some of my time. Um, these are really important connections to be made. These are really important communities uh, that have wonderful things to say, wonderful minds. Um, and I. Um, vehemently encourage you all to uh, make those connections um, and make community building and resistance part of your poetry practice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. Please welcome up Gary. Yay. Well, first of all, I'm really happy to be here and to be invited to this festival to share some of my thoughts, some of my poetry, and to be on this journey with you. So, the other thing I would like to say, it's, I come from a matriarchal society where the women own and rule everything in our life. And so to be, to be able to sit with two wonderful, strong, well-spoken women is such an honor for me. So, to, to, to my friends here. I want to talk a little bit about our origins and where we come from. As I mentioned, um, the Sohwetan culture, or as Canadians might know it, the Shushwap culture is a matriarchal society. The foundation of that is that they own everything. My mother made sure that we knew that. She made sure to teach it to my sisters. So I got five very bossy sisters. <laughs> but, and um, yeah, I had a wife that was really a tough one too, but they knew their job. And that was the important thing. And knowing their, knowing their job as Sohwetan women meant that they would teach each and every member of our society that the women own everything, and the man's job was to protect that. My mother had a saying that even a man comes from a woman, so therefore the first level of respect belongs to the mother. And that philosophy comes from the belief that the earth is our mother so that all things are to be respected from that point forward. <clears throat> so, to have that, those type of teachings um, has been passed on from generation to generation. It's the pedagogy of my culture. So, just like Amber, I don't profess to be any type of a scholar or anything when people ask me about these things. I say, well, I'm just a bushman. I live up in the mountains and, you know, uh, the landscape I come from is a landscape of silence. Um, it's a landscape where the land also speaks loudly and clearly to me. So, from that point of view, I wanted to also share a couple of poems because this is a a poetry festival, and I wanted to share one of them before I get into further uh, discussions here. This is called Sohwapmuch Uluch, and what that means is the land where the Shushwa people come from. She carries his bones along the veins of trails where my grandmother's moccasin-covered feet 
wore away at the earth generations before him, a labor of love. She carries his bones, kicking up the dust, singing pretty words and remembering roots, lingering sage and balsam, where the land was built of bones. So, having said that, one of the things that um, the previous panel was here and Robert was talking about the, um, the importance of indigenous cultures. One of the things, that, and I, I made the comment that uh, Canada needs to understand the whole Canadian history. And the foundation of Canada is really built on common law. And common law centers primarily around property law. Everything is owned by an individual. Totally reversed to my culture. Everything is first of all owned by the women and shared by the men and protected by the men. With that type of pedagogy, when you're brought up with it, and you look at the structure of Canada and the Canadian legal system, the creation of a, a federal statute called the Indian Act, which placed Aboriginal people with invisible boundaries. To tie that into the theme that we wanted to take a look at is how the ground is always shifting. That's a huge, huge um, feat to come over. It's, there's so many challenges to take a look at, not only from the First Nations perspective in Canada, but also from the general population in Canada as well, too. Um, there's been a lot of discussions about this federal statute called the Indian Act, which confines me as an Aboriginal person to an invisible boundary, which very, very, very few non-Aboriginals enter into. Normally the only ones that enter into that boundary are the ones that marry into it. But the general Canadian public has no idea what it's like to live on a day-to-day -day basis in a, river, in, in a reservation system or a reserve system as we call it here in Canada. That invisible boundary is unshakable at this point. And I'm not saying that it's just Canada's fault. I'm saying that it's also the Aboriginal leadership's fault as well too. A lot of my writing talks about and, and questions um, the leadership as well too and saying, listen, I have grandchildren. In my life today, I have eight grandchildren. I don't want my eight grandchildren to be imprisoned as I was because that's what stops um, the transmission of, of, of living together in some sense of, of um, peace. There, is, there are new generations, however, of Aboriginal people um, who are much more open than even my generation or the next generation after me. I'm thinking of my grandchildren. I'm thinking of even my own children. It, it, the work began there, uh, where we are dismantling this invisible boundary, a tiny step at a time, but it's only on a one-sided um, fight here. It's on the Aboriginal side. What's really, really important about this whole issue is that in order to be able to, to, to live together and to take a look at that shifting landscape that we're always going through, people need to be educated about it. People need to be able to ask critical questions. Allies need to be need to be a part of that picture. And I'm, my hope is, for example, in the next two or three generations that will happen. Right now it's a it's a huge struggle. On my own personal journey, for example, I was born into a family of thirteen siblings. I was the only one that went to university. And I was the only one that graduated from high school and then went on to university. 
That was a really scary thing for my mother because she said, you are now going to be the target of everyone's hate, both white and native. And I didn't understand it when I was a real young guy, but I never knew racism until I actually got an education. Before I got that education, to be, it was a norm. It was like, oh well, that's how it is. You know, it, it wasn't, I didn't consider uh, the treatment of my people or other ethnic people to be treated in a racist manner until I went to university. And then I began to understand what racism was all about. So, on the other side of it, on the invisible boundary side of it, in my community, people um, ostracized me for several years because they said he's a sellout, he can't be trusted. He's got a white man's education, he's got this, he's got that, you can't trust him, he's gonna, he's, he's you know. So that was another form of a battle that, that I had to fight. The generations following me, though, didn't. It became easier and easier. Even when my own daughter went to university, it wasn't like that for her, because even her mother, um, you know, coming from a matriarchal society, your mother and your grandmother picks who you're gonna marry, and you have, you know, you got no choice in that. And I come from a very strong tradi traditionalist family. I speak my language. I know the land. I know the medicines. I know the plants. I know all of these different things about my land. And my mother and my father escaped residential schools because they went w way back into the mountains. My grandmothers took them away so that they wouldn't be trapped by residential school. However, their children, including myself, did go to residential school. And that was my mother's and my father's biggest fear. Now, she was a woman, my mother was a woman who fought against the residential schools. She was an uneducated woman in terms of an academic education. But she was one of the ones that single-handedly brought down the residential school system in my area. She, she told the, the Indian agent at that time, um, I am sending my children to a public school so they can get an education like every other Canadian. You will have to imprison me. And they threatened to. But her work, her fight, was for the education that I got. And my fight is for the education that my children got, and now my grandchildren. And my, my grandchildren, they know what I know. I skipped the generation with my own two children because, you know, I had, I tell everybody, I was a parent by the time, I had all my, finished having kids by the time I was 20, which is true. After I was 20 years old, I never had any more kids because I, I married at 16 years old and that was my mother's wish. And I didn't impose that on my own kids though. But my point is, is that, that how, how the landscape, even my own community has changed dramatically over the last 40, 50 years. It's been sudden, it's been swift in some areas but it hasn't been in other areas, and other aspects as well too. Now what does that mean? How do I tie that into living together today? I bring you back to my comments about now's the time for people, not just Aboriginal people, all people, to stand together and to take a look at the indigenous lands that you are standing on and you have a responsibility to do that, to reach out as well, 
to create that aspect of what is an ally and how can we move forward. I had the great pleasure yesterday, um, at the reading yesterday, uh, one of the young men that was sitting in there, and he's sitting over here right now, Brandon, he read a poem that really jumped out at me. Um, and what I saw in his voice was that young, strong, courageous person who was willing to step out of the bounds and out of his invisible boundary to be able to speak about what he saw. And that's exactly what it's going to take to be able for us to move forward and to really understand what the shifting ground looks like. And that's how we're going to come together as people. So having said that, I don't even know how much time I got here left. Oh, four minutes. Then I'm going to read one last poem, which I hope you can think about. And um, I'll let it go with that. It's called Stomas. Recently, I had to start wearing glasses, you know, and it's a piss off because I have to go like this, you know, like, so some, like, this lady here, if I'm not looking over the rim, she's like split. She's this two-spirited woman right there. <laughs> anyway, Stomas. We are all sons and daughters of natural disaster. There will be no moon tonight to glitter on our skins, and the winds have calmed our pretty words. Reality is ugly, but survival is brilliant. As brothers and sisters, we tasted the salty sounds that sprang from the womb, and from our eyes as sons and daughters, we searched for relatives from ocean's edge to ocean's edge. The salt waters are insistent in endless discoveries of failed carcasses washing up against our calloused feet and which did not make it to the sea's depths. The violence in the atmosphere is toxic. Our blood is copper. Our skin is rawhide. But our vision is sharp, even in darkness. A lethal brew of toxicity and climate change the fossils of our organisms will someday be studied. The findings elaborate on the evolution of time, the, morpholo the morphology of survival is, sm is smuggled through time. Time has forgotten the humble survivors. Our secrets hide in the stomas of the world, strategizing for a new world to come. Our hiding relatives, are capable of colonizing in the same pale shadows of the self. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. Our next speaker is Nadine Antoine Mestas. Please welcome her. Yeah, I'm not going to use the podium. I'm 60 inches tall, and you probably only get about 10 inches of me if I use that podium. So I'm just going to gonna do this and maybe pace back and forth out of maybe some nervousness. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, some things that Gary was saying really hit home with me um, in a pretty intense way, things I had forgotten about because. Um, as you may have noticed from my bio, I am very degreed. I have three, four degrees actually, um, two bachelor's degrees, a master's degree, and a PhD. Um, I'm the first person in my family to go to university as well. I'm the first woman in my family to graduate high school without getting pregnant. And that was an enormous amount of, that was a huge thing for my family. Like most of my family flew out to my high school graduation because I managed that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when I went to college, they were just like, wow, that's amazing. But it really distanced me from my family as well and my community. And, um, and I also experienced <laughs> an intense amount of racism and fetishism uh, at university. And um, 
the more degrees I managed to get, the more distant it made me from my family and community. Um, they didn't know how to talk to me. They didn't feel comfortable talking to me. My mom didn't even call me to college. And uh, my grandma was the only one that would write me letters. And uh, she would send me care packages from home. So it really, really distanced me in this intense way. And like, when you were talking, I was almost going to cry. I'm going to do it right now. Uh, <laughs> So it was really it was an intense experience um, to have, and I was taken out of the context of my community and put in a number of different communities um, that I had to figure out how to live with, how to work with, and they had to figure out how to work with me. So to be on this panel is really interesting because you know talking about living in a bioregion that we're calling socially and culturally diverse, right? Now I came. I'm originally from New Mexico, and I grew up in a small town um, called Dorieta and in the mountains on a ranch. Um, and there was two white families in our town. That's it. Um, everybody was Spanish or Pueblo Indian. Um, and then at one point, uh, an African American family moved there for like a year and then left. They were like, OK, we got to go. <laughs> so this is working out for us, right? Um, so then uh, when I, I moved to, my mom, uh, for the purpose of, of work, moved us to California and right into Los Angeles and we moved into this enormous apartment complex that was almost entirely Asian. Um, a ton of Asian immigrants from primarily four different countries and the apartment complex was kind of broken up into these four quadrants. And I lived in the uh, Korean section of this. And it was an intense culture shock because I showed up to Los Angeles wearing shorts, you know, a little cowboy shirt, and a bolo tie, and cowboy boots. <laughs> so I got into a lot of fights like, really immediately. <laughs> and he would just pick on me and my brother and say, you, you talk funny. Why do you talk like that? You know, I still have these remnants of, of speaking. A lot of people, I think they say w warm or something. It sounds like warm to me. But in New Mexico, we, our A's are really short. So we say warm. And people still make fun of me for these very small things. And if I'm on the phone with my family, that accent comes out really, really fast. You know, and then people are looking at me like I'm totally weird. Right? Um, so <laughs> what brought me to the Northwest, again, was yet another degree. Um, so I went to the University of Washington for my PhD, and that's how I landed in Seattle, and that's where I live now. Right? Seattle gets criticized for not being a very diverse place at all, all the time. You know, we're one of the whitest states in the country, in the United States, right? Um, and it's, it, so it's interesting to be on this, on this panel and be thinking about different contexts that I've, I've lived in, and now I'm living in well, Seattle, and really, I am the diversity there. <laughs> that's, I, I bring the diversity there. You know, that's what I do. And it's like kind of a big responsibility. And um, it's a lot of work. And sometimes it's a burden. And sometimes it's just fucked up. Um, but there's a joke that you know I make with friends and colleagues of mine. And I make it with Paul all the time. And, and uh, that <laughs> there's. One, you know, when you look at those boxes for diversity, cultural and social diversity, there's one box that I, I can't check, and that's disability, right? When I come from a low-income family, a single mother with a teenage pregnancy, you know, um, <laughs> I'm, you know, multiracial and I'm queer, right? So it's this, this plus I'm a woman, right? <laughs> And so there's a lot of like things on that diversity spectrum that I'm hitting. So it's like I'm always bringing the diversity to the situation, you know. Except when in a place like New Mexico, where I grew up, um, the white people were bringing the diversity. <laughs> um, and you know, context really matters. You know, as we're thinking about the ground is always shifting, and this is how my ground has shifted in different places that I've lived. Right um, when I was in graduate school at the University of Michigan, um, there, there's not a really big Hispanic population out there. Um, and a lot of the indigenous cultures have 
they're, they're pretty much invisible. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> people think I'm a lot of different things. And when I was in the Midwest, all people just always assumed that I was from the Middle East. <laughs> when I was living in New York, people assumed that I was Puerto Rican. <laughs> right? Uh, in, you know, the only place, in, when I was in Germany, people assumed I was Peruvian. Right? And in, now that I live in Seattle, everyone automatically assumes I'm affiliated with one of the tribes in the, in the, in the area. Right? Um, and that, that context really matters. The only place that, that I've lived that I never really get this odd assortment of assumptions of what my identity is, is San Francisco. Because there's been so much multiracial mating there for so many generations that there's a lot of ambiguous people in San Francisco, so it feels comfortable there, you know? Um, so, um, um, yeah, so this is an interesting um, thing for me to think about and also an uncomfortable thing to think about, you know? Um, what, what does it mean to live among people that aren't like you, right? How do you get along? Where do you find commonalities? You know, so when I'm thinking about living in Seattle, you know, how do I find commonalities with, with Seattleites, right? This very, as it's described, very passive-aggressive, white, hopped-up-on-coffee culture. <laughs> and, um, and one of the things that, that at some point, I, I was walking around Seattle, and you know, everybody smiles at you, but they give you this really awkward, tight-lipped smile. <laughs> and, um, and I'm just like with, you know, my lips, I'm like, hey, you know, I have a full smile, I'm not like making my lips tense, and people will just be like, oh, God, was she looking at me like that? You know, was she hitting on me? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm just smiling back at you. So after a few years of this, I found myself acclimating to that very tight-lipped smile, you know? And I was like, what the hell? You know, this is so awkward, and it's kind of a lot of work to do that, you know? <laughs> I mean, wasting energy acclimating in uncomfortable ways. You know, why am I doing that? Uh, what is happening? Um, I'm gonna stop. Um, so I went back to just my natural smile and, you know, let my big lips out, hey, and I make people uncomfortable. You know, and it's, we live in the same place. We live in the same neighborhood. So that's, that's how it's got to be. You're going to get used to me, right? Um, I wear bow ties and ties a lot. And I wear vests. And that makes people uncomfortable. Um, but they get used to me, you know? They, they get used to me, and I become part of the neighborhood, part of the city. In fact, I just met someone earlier who said she had seen me walking around Seattle. She's like, I've seen you walking around. Just going like, hey. I was like, I, I guess I do walk like that around Seattle. And, um, <laughs> and, red shoes. Yeah, yeah, and the red shoes, right? So, um, so it's it's you know we, in, when we're living together in these places, um, and in these spaces, we have to deal with uncomfortability, uncomfortable situations. You know, we have to learn how to negotiate these kinds of situations. You know, we can call them boundaries, we can call them personalities, uh, but whatever it is, we have to learn to do that. Um, in Seattle, probably one of the most diverse communities that I get to be a part of is the queer community, because it cuts across all cross-sections of life, right? And it includes everything, and almost anywhere I've, I've gone and have been part of the queer community, it's the most diverse community, right? Um, and it's, it's very inclusive. Of a lot of people. Like you don't even have to be queer to be part of the queer community. You can just be an ally who wants to participate um, and support, you know. Um, but, you know, there's queer people in all walks of life, and then there's a place for them in the queer community. So, you know, I get to hang out with so many different kinds of people from so many different kinds of places in a city that's called absolutely not diverse. Right? It's like supposedly one of the whitest cities in, in the country. Um, and, uh, and that seems pretty significant and important, and nobody really talks about that. 
You know, nobody really talks about how diverse the queer community is. In fact, we still criticize how it's not diverse. It's, it's too white. It's always, everything's always too white. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Maybe you need to talk to some of the people in your community and figure out what's really there, you know. Um, I am the lightest skinned person in my family. I have very light skin. Um, unless I live in Southern California and I'm in the sun all the time and then I get very dark. Um, and, you know, so if I didn't have this nose, didn't have these cheekbones, you know, if I didn't have this face, I would look just like white people. <laughs> and, um, and there's a lot of people out there that are like that though. There's a lot of people, you know, that are, are like that. They just, you just, you don't know who they are. You don't know what they're bringing to the community unless you talk to them or at least share an experience in a community setting with them. Just because somebody looks a certain way, you know, you, do, you, you can make a lot of assumptions about them. But there's just been so many, you know, cross-racial mating situations and violent ones at that. Violent histories of it um, that you really don't know what is behind someone's face or their skin color. Now that really seems important to figure out as well, or at least not to make odd assumptions about who people are. Uh, and and um, so I just want to take a minute to read this poem from the anthology um, about Seattle. Um, I really love spiders and uh, Something about spider webs is really relevant to thinking about communities and how we are linked together. Uh, this is my first and possibly only Seattle poem. Spider noises. As early as 4 a.m., I can only suspect the mutable noises of spiders. Their continuous threading, slipping, and jumping. To make a net a lot like a baseball glove, I tell myself the changeable morning, the sun coming up only to stay. I silently say, behind the clouds, a bright day. The spider, crisscrossing the window pane, knows better and launches his body again and again. I wonder, waking to the morning white, what are spiders made of? Suspicious of the sky, I tell myself, leaning, reclining, bending, yes, bending. Today I will only think about birds eating spiders, eating birds eating spiders, and the cats that watch them carnivorous creatures, creatures in trees, and creatures with silky threads. I think and I look out to the Olympics, the Cascades, and Rainier, and see all around the gloomy blue, thick like paint darkening. All around the day, the leaning clouds gather to say to the mountains, today we will change you forever. Listen, I'm not crazy, but this emerged from the belly of the mountains. I am a walrus, I am a walrus, I am the Eggman. Cuckoo, kichu, cuckoo, kichu. And the vibrations of the mountain were felt, twanging those silky threads on all the window panes and all the branches between bushes and trees and crevices of cars and trucks and trash. And I hear the quite early morning murmur of Seattle speaking soft, indistinct stories of the very oldest particles as they stand out there in time, a broken hymn becoming something else, an implosion within a non-air system of angelic orders. Their bluish muffle, a breathing of technology, the way the throat short-circuited absolute beauty over us, angry, hoary breath it has. Every season it becomes unbearable, too frigid to tell love eating love is a symptom and that no one wanted to know birds, bats, foxes, and butterflies are all involved in this February, March, and April. Thank you. Nadine. So let's go to back to you guys to see if you have any additional comments or anything in response to what you've heard. I just want to say how frequently allyship and discomfort um, 
the critical importance of negotiating our, our comfortability um, and community building is. So if anyone's feeling uncomfortable, as you, you're doing your work, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks, <laughs> okay, Tim. And I think too, we all come, there was three very different um, regions, I guess, that we sort of um, talked about. And it's critical to understand how to, to move forward um, and, and live, I guess, together. Um, because you can't do that unless you know something about your neighbors. And that's, that's one of the things in our, you know, my dad always said, you gotta know something about your neighbors in order to live with them. And I think looking at the diversity in which we come from, we have to know something about that diversity in order to move forward and live that. And I think we had three very different perspectives. You know, the East Side Vancouver one, the Seattle one, and the Res one. <laughs> I just talked a lot, so I don't have any comments right now. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could touch on, before I open it to questions, um, you all talked a little bit about that idea of the ally and also the being visible, invisible, or disappearing, or how not to disappear. Mm -hmm. The challenges of entering the mainstream culture uh, or of re-entering your own culture after you've exited it. And um, I'm just wondering if you can say, touch a little bit more on that. Amber, also the being in one culture and entering another culture. So now you're in an academic setting somewhat. Mm -hmm. And what those, you know, that tension of living in these two worlds or negotiating those two worlds. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> So I'm a new adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia and also at Douglas College. Um, university life is entirely new to me. Um, I, I have an MFA from UBC, so I, I went right back to the campus uh, where I was doing my own creative writing workshops. Um, I, I didn't have the confidence to enter that arena, to be honest with you. I was very encouraged by colleagues on that campus to get my foot in, in, in the adjuncting door, which for many of you, you understand exactly what, what adjuncting is all about. Um, <laughs> and probably for my first semester, at least on campus, it was um, a learning curve, how to fit, how to straddle worlds. Um, again, straddling worlds is not a new thing to me. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of things that occur to me, like the population of UBC campus is six times larger than the community that I grew up in. Um, and, you know, UBC publishes everyone's salaries, so you can take a look on it online if anyone is curious. Um, so it's to see the disparity in um, how colleagues get paid. Um, was interesting. It's very easy for me to fall into the trap of anger. Um, but then I see what I want to see. I see uh, what I have arrived uh, into a teaching profession for, and, and that is that I see a number of students who are young creative writers uh, who are having a heck of a time acclimating to university culture, uh, who know that they can write, and have been told that campus is the place where this can happen for them, where they can um, harness their craft, perhaps become published authors. Um, but in so many ways, they don't fit. They don't fit into campus life, and it's a huge challenge for them. Um, a lot of young women have read this book, who take my class. Um, that was worth putting my face on the cover which I didn't want to have happen. Um, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was worth coming out. Uh, it was worth letting people witness me and my struggle, um, my ability to um, outlive circumstances. Uh, it, it creates some level of trust and hope amongst these students that are struggling so much. Um, yeah, and I, I, I take great pride in my poetry class 
my poetry workshop in particular, I have other classes too, but my poetry workshop in particular has, has become a real finding place. It has become a place of, of, of refuge. Yes, still rigorous in craft and technique. Uh, they still have to turn in their page counts, their portfolios, etc. Um, but has come, become a place where we can come together um, throughout all of our differences um, and feel like we're creating a safe space that fosters poetry, um, but also the self. Uh, so that's that's been something that I think my work has allowed me to do as a teacher. Um, I'm really honored to straddle worlds, um, to be an ally. I consider myself a chronic learner. Um, and, and yeah, it's uncomfortable learning, but I'm really, I'm really proud to do so. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> You know, I'm here just to <laughs> I'm not as beautiful as she is, that's for sure. Um, what was the question again? Yeah, no. yeah the question is it was a meaty question. It was meaty, yeah. That idea of visible, invisible, entering the larger community or going back to your community in the struggle. Uh, okay. well, earlier this morning, somebody uh, in the previous panel said, you know, like, um, something about... Uh, First Nations and, and Indigenous languages, um, that, the, that the government doesn't uh, view that. Well, actually, that's not true. <laughs> um, every um, district, uh, school district in the province is mandated to provide a First Nations language as an option to French in Canada. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people don't know that and the districts don't promote it, yeah. but they get millions of dollars to do that. So, in my particular case, I'm a principal at a school, um, an independent provincial school, and when I became principal three years ago, the first thing I said, every teacher in that school, and to every parent, this is a bicultural, bilingual, school. You have the option right now of walking out. If you choose to stay, then you can understand that the worldview and half of the curricula is going to be based on Sobatan culture and language. They stayed. And um, the, the thing I guess that I would like to talk about is in one sense, since 1984, when Canada finally got its own constitution, there was the first time in a hundred and something years that Indians, like me, were allowed to leave the reserve legally without having the Indian agent stamp our card. Now, that's in your guys' lifetime. So under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, we were given that sense of freedom. Now what that meant was that we could leave the reserve. Well, many people did prior to that, you know. And, um, but it sort of opened up more for our people to engage in this notion of creating allies. And I think it really worked well because kids that started to get into high school in the 90s and that sort of thing into the you know 2000, and they really uh, changed that landscape. And but they had to do the work. Um, the white Canadians sort of did not take the make the effort to do it. And um, so it really came from the indigenous push, and you know sometimes it meant really getting into into the face of people, but it did. They they were the warriors at the time. They broke open that ground, and it paved the way for many of them to graduate in high school and move on to university. And I think it's a different landscape in university now than when I went to university. So. It's interesting you're both talking about young people and how young people are causing this shift in the yeah. landscape and in the ground. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Brandon right there is an example of it. Yeah. 
he, you know, he, he dared make a statement that people are too damn afraid to make. So it's the young people that has that courage. The older ones want to be safe. You know, these people want to write out still about flowers and pretty little things, and they, how dare you challenge Canadian politics or policy? How dare you do that? Or American policy or politics? But I see that the younger people um, are doing that. And I, too, worked for Simon Fraser University for 20 years. I, was, I taught English for Simon Fraser University. So I really, really pushed uh, students. I challenged them. I said, you know, and they were courageous. They took up the challenge. So that's what I, yeah. Great, great. Uh, I, I love being able to inhabit both worlds. And I stopped trying to fit into any world a long time ago. Because as I said before, it's, it's too much work. Uh, and people, they can see that. They can feel that, you know. So. But the, the concept or issue of, of allies, that's a pretty huge one, because it's really, really hard to get mainstream cultures invested in whatever community you're thinking about, you know, like whether it's a minority community or a subculture of some sort. It's really hard to get people invested and to care. And sometimes that can be like even within your own family or that your closest friends you know, say like, oh, well, you're different. So I like you, but I can't, I don't want to do that work. And it's like, I'm not different, and you're being rude to me right now. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it, I don't know, I, I, I love it, you know, and I, I think it's a great time. <laughs> yeah. great. Okay, let's open it up to questions. Paul. First of all, I was incredibly moved by all of your presentations. <laughs> Nadine, you say in San Francisco they don't make assumptions about you, but I would ask you to encourage if one of the assumptions they would make about you in San Francisco is that you work for Google. <laughs> <laughs> and considering the hyper, what is it be called, hyper gentrification in San Francisco, and the fact that we look at San Francisco on the West Coast as yes. kind of being ahead of the curve, we see it happening in Seattle. In Vancouver, there was a house that went for a record over the amount that was asked for, $535,000 or something, over the asking price. So, I mean, how do we address the issues that you're talking about? And you seem to indicate that there's some progress with the tremendous force of casino capitalism and the culture that it brings, or the anti-culture. How do we begin to, to mount a defense uh, for ourselves and for this kind of work and for this kind of being in the world? <laughs> I, can, I can set myself up for that. I can say you've got two minutes. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, a lifetime of work, right? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a really hard question, and I don't think San Francisco is ahead of the curve anymore. Um, that landscape is changing so fast, and uh, so is Seattle. Um, and in fact, Seattle is ahead of the curve. You know, in, in my opinion, Seattle is the new spot um, where things are being pushed like really hard in that direction. Um, and I feel pretty unrelentingly certain about that um, because I live there and I, you know, my family, I'm from the West and I've lived in many cities up and down the West Coast and progressive cities of sorts. And part of the reason this is happening in Seattle is because we are getting overflow from some of these cities that are becoming enormously expensive. So I think actually the work is just going to move and that there is no real way to defend ourselves against something like that's happening um, in San Francisco. But it's going to change other places as well. Um, like Idaho, for instance, apparently Boise is like starting to get kind of hopping right now. And you're like, really? It's Boise. Um, so, and, I, and I went there and I was like, man, they, they kind of weren't kidding, you know? I, I still felt really uncomfortable and a little terrified being being gay there, but, uh, you know, my friends were like, there's there's two gay, gay men over there having dinner. I was like, awesome, dude. You know? so, uh, maybe I'll go eat dinner with them. So, yeah, I mean, I could, you know, I could probably do a lifetime of scholarship and cultural work on on this issue. So, and probably will. Up there. Oh, 
I really value um, all three of you and, and your um, vulnerability and your courage. And I want to thank you for bringing us into your world. Yeah, it's incredibly valuable. Um, here you speak of um, that we have to do the work, and I totally agree with you on that. Um, what work would each of you like to see us do? Did, you, did everyone hear? So what work would each of you like to see us do? I'm leaving. No, just kidding. <laughs> She's got the mic, so she'll answer first. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, I would like to actually just see people move out of their comfort zones and find a little bit of investment in, in other cultures and other lifestyles. You know, um, I was just earlier having a conversation outside of the tables with someone who was basically being jumped into queer culture conversation that she had not really been invited to. <laughs> so she has another Faisa. And, um, and that was amazing. I mean, it was an amazing experience because she was letting us know. She's like, I've never really had the opportunity to be involved in a conversation like this. you know. And we were talking about some pretty risky and taboo subjects in this conversation. And, and she just went with the flow, you know, and it was it was really really beautiful. She did the work, you know, and even like if it made her uncomfortable, she worked with the uncomfortability of it. And I don't know how uncomfortable or comfortable she was, but um, but it felt comfortable to have the conversation with her in it, you know. And and I think that like that's the kind of work I'd like to see more people doing. It's just like you know get out there, learn some stuff, uh, leave your neighborhood, you know, um, just just. Eat something else. I don't know. <laughs> eat something else. <laughs> Did you say eat something else? <laughs> okay. I realized that can be taken in a number of contexts. That's so. very poetic. I mean, it's got double meanings and you know, that, that's great. <laughs> well, I I think Nadine said it. Um, I think stepping out of your comfort zone. Like, um, I know from, I, I grew up on the res, I still live on the res. Um, it's just sort of like extending that hand and saying, hey, um, let's, let's talk about stuff. Let's, let's cross this boundary here and let's open it up to some dialogue. Let's, you know, come and visit on the res and, you know. Um, it's a totally different mentality there. And it's not just a powwow scene or, you know, it's sitting there watching mothers work with their children. It's sitting, you know, like my grandmother, you know, my mother used to sit there for hours, like working with cedar roots. And just, it's a totally different um, experience. And I think, um, I think people would be very open now to sharing that, because there's a different mentality. It's a, there's a different sort of uh, feeling within within the res life. There's still that old guard, you know. There is that, but there a, another group of people that are reaching out too, but they don't know how to do it. And it's you know, they, I think in the Aboriginal community, they're afraid to take that first step. You know. So I mean, I think I think if it was if people are open to it, taking that step and saying, "Hey, you know, I want to get to know you, your family, your community, or whatever," it would happen. So just not be afraid to, um, you know, take be courageous and just step out of your own sort of comfort zone. I think, yeah. yeah. Or be afraid and do it anyways. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be afraid and go for it. They don't scalp anymore. <laughs> this is the question. This this is the question. How do we learn allyship? It's a different kind of learning uh, than what we're accustomed to. Many of us were educated in some sort of school system uh, where the published word was the authority. The published word was probably lit, written by a certain cross-section of the population. 
Um, this has been extremely evident to me as an experiential sex worker. Uh, we are one of the most researched populations in existence. Uh, the researchers are often scholars who have actually no firsthand uh, relationship with our communities, and the research has gained us fuck all. <laughs> fuck all. Your first step in being an ally is nothing about us without us. You find organizations, you find community groups, you find individuals who are experiential. It doesn't matter if we're talking about sex work. It doesn't matter if we're talking about indigenous justice. It doesn't matter if we're talking about disability justice. You find the people who are experiential and you ask, what do you want your allies to do to support you? What is your movement all about? What do you need from people who want to show up? And you let their leadership create the movement that you're an ally with it. That is how to do it. That's the only way to do it. Do not read one more fucking research paper. <laughs> Don't do it. Within the communities that you're already established in, look who's not there. If you see another list of best Canadian poetry, and it's all white people, inquire why that is. Why does it keep happening again and again? If you're invited to a poetry festival, if you're invited to a panel, if you're invited to a conference, ask who else is receiving invitations. Ask what other panelists are getting paid. Ask if there's pay equity. Ask who's going to be there. Don't stop asking questions. Look for leadership within our communities. That is what we have to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we also need to ask ourselves. I think we need to turn that lens to ourselves sometimes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have another question up here. I can't. I can't talk. Awesome, but I mean, I know what I look like. Yeah. 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 I know when I get up in the morning, what people see, and I go into the world uncomfortable every day of my life. Yeah. I put myself in uncomfortable situations all the time. But this is for you, Nadine, because I'm from Seattle as well. <laughs> what do you think of the whole hashtag race together? Hashtags. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, I don't even really know what that means exactly. Race, like we're all going to be a race together, or run a, a race of diversity together. together. It's like, like, is that what that that's about? It's well, like, I think it was just something to throw out there to get people just to start talking about it, to have some conversation about race and race together. That's a, that sounds like an odd way to start a conversation about race. <laughs> and honestly, um, I don't know how effective that is going to be. It sounds very Seattle, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably it's probably too comfortable to actually be effective. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad you made that comment about going out in the world uncomfortable every day because I was thinking about that, and you know, like I go out into the world in like in uncomfortable situations every day as well. Um, and sometimes dangerous situations, right? That's the other thing. I'm in danger frequently. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm looking around the room and wondering who else has this kind of experience? Like, who's, who here has that experience? You feel like you're going out in the world and uncomfortable every day. Um, and maybe if you don't feel that way, you should wonder what's up. Like, what, why are you staying so safe and stuff like that? Race together is... I mean, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call bullshit on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you didn't do that hashtag, did you? I'm sorry. <laughs> Starbucks. Yeah. yeah. Starbucks. Oh, this is are they? Like are they giving out free coffee or something? Yeah, I know. On Facebook, all the racist. Yeah, that's that's really awkward. That's yeah. not experiential leadership. Well, for people to see that on their cups and they didn't know what to do with it. I wonder what a more effective hashtag would be. We have another question here, and then two more over there. Hi. Um, um, when I look at you, and whenever I travel to any conference, and this is my first conference being a poetry 
um, I just look at you as all souls, one color. For me, I look at beyond what your skin is, beyond what your background is, and that's how I talk with people, that's how I, um, I look at people. I don't know how people look at me, uh, that's their issue, uh, yeah. but uh, my perspective to, to interact with people is coming from how I want this world to be. We are all one, mm -hmm. we're all created as one, and we were put in different nations for a reason, so we can all understand each other, and so we can all be, um, be human. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm really, I'm really uh, happy to be among people, different, different races, uh, and poetry is uniting us, and we are all together. Um, and this is something beautiful, something coming from human, uh, the real human side. Uh, my question for you, Nadine, about Seattle. Uh, <laughs> two years ago, when I was a refugee, uh, not knowing anything about, about us. Uh, Seattle or the United States, I was a refugee um, running from war, I ran from prosecution by the uh, Saddam's regime. Uh, somebody told me, go to Seattle, there's diversity, open minded, they will appreciate you. They will be, you, will be, you will be fine there. And uh, and I did I did choose Seattle and to be frank with you, I feel very, very comfortable in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do find the diversity and I do find people who are um, who welcomed me. I, I like to smile, and they were smiling back. Yeah. That was just pre-9-11. Mm -hmm. After 9-11, yeah. <laughs> uh, after 9-11, yeah. I had to build the, I, I had to hold the, 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 the burden of all mm -hmm. my religion background yeah. um, and being for that. So uh, to, to find, to, to feel other people, maybe you should try to wear a scarf one day and walk around Seattle That's and see good. how you, how people look at you and how people yeah. look at you. But uh, even though, even though that was a difficult time with all the nation we went through, even that I, 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 I found beauty. I found people who came to me and say, uh, you know, if you are afraid, I will protect you. If you cannot go out, I will do that. That beauty, that that thing, I really, really. Uh, that's what I look. I look at the brighter side. Mm -hmm. uh, the issues can come up when we uh, maybe we are working. We are working this generation, the second generation. But the issues can be tackled in the way that we we shed more light on the beauty, beautiful side of human. Yeah. I, you know, I agree with you about the diversity in Seattle. Um, it's not. We, there's a way in which we don't see diversity in Seattle because the conversation in the United States is mostly focused on black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, that's that's how diversity is measured by dark skin, um, which is really quite fucked up. Um, and that, that's that's a GRE word right there, fuck it. Um, but um, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. And I've actually looked up the statistics, um, national statistics of diversity, or census, I guess, um, for Seattle versus the, the nation. And uh, they're, we're actually really not that far off from the national averages in terms of representation. Um, but there's a, a, a really weird thing that happens is that we just sort of like let everything else fall away if we don't see dark skin. So like we don't even really account for like indigenous cultures being part of diversity there mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Asian cultures. And it's a huge part of the diversity in Seattle, right? Um, but we somehow just don't see that for some reason, um, and it's it's really, really awkward. I mean, I would like to see um, white people in Seattle just being less scared and terrified. They're so scared all the time, you know? They're just like tense and scared. And um, I'm like, oh my god, I'm just, I'm just a person. Don't be so terrified. <laughs> um, we have time for one quick question. How are you going to pick? What are you going to do? Nobody's putting their hand up, so maybe we're... Wait, yes, I, right I don't know about receiving. If there's someone right. here has his hand up. Oh, okay. I was going to make comments. Okay, let's, let's go with the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so my question, I think, it was comment plus question, but I'll try to trim it down. Um, <laughs> it's about what has been your experience of 
traversing the world of poetry. And what I'm thinking about is how we've had these lush conversations about how our poetry and everything springs from the land. And I'm interested in how our bodies are also a type of land. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about what Gary commented on in the last panel when he said, I don't know why I'm not up there, you know, or talking about language, and instead I get kind of put on these diversity panels or something like that. Yeah. And I'm really interested in like why that is this like compartmentalization and what your experience is walking through the world, particularly the poetry world, and what kinds of ghettoization you may or may not experience. Yeah. Great question. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good one. Well, you, you get invited to a lot of st stuff when you bring the diversity. That's that's one thing that happens. It's like you know you're like oh we need more diversity. Let's let's find people of color, and that that's it's an awkward experience. You know and tomorrow I'm on a on a panel that's about this. I think I'm going to have this very experience. Um, but uh, the poetry world is also really awkward because some of it is it's very compartmentalized as well. You have like poets of color. You have experimental poets which are primarily white. And you have you know the, all these different sections of poetry, and it can be really interesting moving in these worlds and have people making assumptions about what kind of poetry you probably write based on your identity. Like you probably write you know issue-driven poems about migrant labor meeting. It's like no, that, I, that's a good idea. I've never done it. You know maybe I'll try it. You know you probably write poems about like lesbian stuff. It's like, <laughs> Yeah, the spiders are kind of lesbian, so it's not like the main one's right, you know? But it's, it's really like the assumptions that people make about you, um, and that where you belong in something, you know, and it can be really awkward. You're like, I, I actually belong on that, that panel, like Gary's saying, and, and why am I on this panel? Like, why isn't some white person on this panel, you know, or, or whatever? Um, and it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good. <laughs> yeah, you are the diversity. <laughs> Well, let's just say I stepped out of my comfort zone. <laughs> no, actually, this was a great panel, to be honest. Yeah, it is. You know, it's, a, it's an awesome panel. And I mean, um, I suppose my comment, my previous comment on, on the culture and language is because, because I have such a strong passion for my identity and my culture. And that passion is that warrior that comes through me from my mother's teachings because it's been attacked for the last 200 years. So, um, my comment was not, you know, like, uh, in, in a mean way. It's just something that I know about, and it's because I've had to be that warrior. And I've had to, you know, pick it up where my, 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 my mother and her mother, and her mother before her, and all of them left off. That's where my passion is. But in terms of, like, looking at um, surviving in, in, in a diverse situation um, and how that reflects through poetry. I mean, people have read my, 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 my other book called um, Whiskey Bullets and is looking at the duality because I grew up in a rodeo ranching family mm. plus I grew up with a really, you know, like with the matriarchs of my family saying, don't you forget who you are. This land is where your ancestors' dust is, you know? So I, I remembered all of those things. So there's, the, there's that duality of looking at, you know, this cowboy rancher image, as well as where the womb and where I come from. And so when I wrote that book, Whiskey Bullets, and, you know, uh, a lot of people were coming back to me, you know, and there, some some guy did a, um, a uh, review on it and says, yeah, he's looking at his two-spirit, you know, sexuality, and it was all about, and then he, there was talking about Brokeback Mountain, and, you know, and this, you know, that was, that was an actual um, review of the book, right? And to me, it was looking at the duality within all of us. That may be gay, that may be queer, that may be white, that might be uh, Métis, that might be whatever it is, right? And I think poetry has to do its job and that it has to have multiple meanings in it. 
Every word needs to count. So you should be able to look at, you know, and at first I was like kind of pissed off at these guys, like, what the fuck is he thinking about? Like, you know, like, and then I got to thinking, hey, I did my job. I did my job. And, and you can embrace that part of it too. So I think poetry is not what I am, it, it, it's not for me. When, it, when it's written, it's like an orgasm, it's gone. <laughs> but it's now for the audience. <laughs> right? you, got, you got that poem, you interpret it, you read it, you, you do what you will with it. And I think that's, that's the beauty of it. So, yeah. We are over time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. I think, I think I can summarize that by saying it's for listening, right? What we do as listeners is we are allies by first listening. Thank you so much. Come and chat with them if you want.